we're here with Chris Williamson at the Leisure Center in Rochdale, which has become tonight the election center. They're still counting the votes behind us, but uh, it seems pretty clear now that George Galloway has won. He'll be going back to Westminster for the seventh time. Yep. Uh, historic victory, we believe. And, uh, it's not just a, a win for, for, for George Galloway. Uh, we think he's won by a large margin which is uh, an incredible uh, you know, vindication, I think, of the campaign that we've won, a huge endorsement for George, and uh, a real indication, I think, that, you know, that people are sick to death of the political status quo. You know, our democracy has been stolen from us because, you know, look, democracy, politics, should be about giving people a choice. But the truth is that both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, the two mainstream parties, are offering effectively the same proposition when it comes to the economy. They're both signed up to near disastrous neoliberal economics, uh, and they're both uh, in the pockets of the war machine. Uh, you know, people have been utterly uh, horrified and, and disgusted by the, uh, uh, the the appalling scenes that they've seen on their television screens and on their smartphones, uh, where we are seeing, you know, for the first time, actually, uh, you know, a genocide taking place. Uh, before our very eyes, in real time. Now, you know, genocides have happened in the past. Uh, you know, the United States was was built on a genocide. Australia was built on a genocide. Uh, and, you know, the horrors that are being visited on the Palestinian people today, of course, were visited on, uh, you know, the Native Americans and on the Aboriginal people uh, in, in, in Australia. Um, the difference now, of course, is that we're witnessing it. And what people find it impossible to countenance is the fact that our politicians can't find it within themselves to support an unconditional ceasefire. But look, an unconditional ceasefire is the minimum that we require. What we need is not just a ceasefire, we need to be implementing an arms embargo against Israel because we're facilitating this genocide by continuing to supply arms to them. We should be implementing a, a, a trade blockade. We should be kicking Israel out of all international sporting and, and international civilised activities, they're going to participate in the Eurovision Song Contest. I mean, Israel isn't even in Europe, and it's going to participate in the Eurovision Song Contest as if nothing is happening. Absolutely despicable. And, and so people are revolted by that. And, and what's significant, I think, is that, you know, for the first time in recent by-elections, people have been given a genuine progressive alternative. And they voted for it, it seems, in huge numbers. Uh, and that will, I think, give, give huge encouragement to uh, other insurgent uh, candidates and, 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 uh, and independent uh, movements, and of course the Workers' Party itself, uh, you know, to field more, yet more candidates. So we're talking about fielding potentially, uh, 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 you know, 50 candidates, That was our, that, but we may do more. Um, but what we also want to do is collaborate with and work with other, uh, you know, insurgent uh, campaigns across the country to offer people a real alternative come the general election, which is bound to take place, I think probably later this year, but the latest it can be is, uh, is in uh, January uh, next year. But I I'm predicting that the election will take place in, in November uh, 2024. And you're the deputy leader of the party, a new party started by George Galloway. This is the first member that you're going to be seating in uh, Parliament. Uh, are you going to run yourself? Well, I've been approached to uh, stand in my home city of Derby. I was the MP in Derby North. I've been approached by uh, a big section of the community in Derby South uh, to put my uh, hat in the ring there. I mean, Derby South actually is a seat uh, is a seat where I was a councillor for 20 years, and it's a it's a it's a part of the city uh, where I uh, lived in the uh, earlier part of my life with my, with my uh, parents uh, when I was a, a youngster growing up. Uh, so I have a real affinity uh, with that uh, part of the uh, city. I've not. Um, uh, made a definite decision as to whether I uh, will stand or not, but uh, certainly what we will uh, ensure is that whether it be me or, or someone else, we will definitely be fielding a candidate there because we have to punish the Labour Party uh, because the Labour Party has, has, has lost touch with its base, it's lost touch with its, uh, its progressive uh, roots. Um, there used to be a large contingent in the Labour Party, a pro-peace uh, contingent in the Labour Party, you know. Um, there was a, uh, a, a large um, uh, uh, cohort that that supported, um, you know, an alternative economic strategy, a socialist proposition for the country. I mean, you know, Tony Benn used to talk about, you know, the Labour Party is not a socialist party, but it's, it's a party that's got socialists within it. Well, the socialists have been kicked out. They've either been kicked out, suspended, or resigned. There are maybe some left, but they're just keeping their heads down. There is no point in being in a pol political party 
you know, if you're not prepared to speak up for what you believe in, what's the point of being there? It's not a social club, it's not a football team, you know, it's, it's, it's a vehicle to try and deliver, or it should be anyway, to deliver uh, change. And Low Pot is not offering any change. It's unusual that Consortium News is a Washington-based publication, and we're here in a by-election uh, in the north of England, near, outside Manchester, because of such the such importance of this election uh, on so many grounds. Gaza, of course, being the fact that it's an international election in a small, relatively small yes. town. However, what is the message that's being sent tonight to Labour, as you said before, uh, rather than just the Tories? Should they be worried tonight about this election victory by George Gallagher? Well, yes, I think they should be worried because, uh, as I've said, there will be uh, a lot of candidates standing against Labour Party. Look, I've spoken to a lot of people <coughs> in, in different constituencies. In constituencies, actually, which are currently held by the Conservative Party, um, <coughs> where, which the Labour Party would probably expect to, to win. They certainly have the seats were, that, were, that were won by Labour under the, under the Blair era. Um, and, and they recognise it. It would be probably a, a, you know a, a bridge too far to expect that an insurgent campaign could win. But what they're saying is, we're not actually wanting to field candidates to to necessarily win. We want to punish the Labour Party. We want to make sure that the Labour Party lose. And they're prepared to even you know tolerate a Tory victory because. Frankly, I, I think the Labour Party is a lost cause. But if there is going to any prospect of the Labour Party being redeemed, uh, then they need to pay an electoral price for their support for uh, the genocide in Gaza, for their support for neoliberal economics, which has destroyed the lives of millions of people in this country. Our, our industrial base has been wrecked. You know, jobs have been offshored to low-wage economies. You know, our public services are in meltdown. Um, we have the most parsimonious social security system anywhere uh, virtually anywhere in, in, in Europe, in what is the sixth biggest economy in the world. And we've got, you know, 14, 15 million people living in poverty. Uh, precarious employment is now endemic throughout the land. They're constantly increasing the retirement age. The pensions are, are nowhere near adequate enough, unless you happen to have been lucky enough to have, a, have an occupational pension. But they're changing the rules to, uh, you know, limit the, uh, the, the, in, the amount of pension that people can get from their occupational pensions totally disgraceful you know we're a wealthy country we're a powerful economy and what we should be doing is making sure that the economy works for the many not the few you know a strap line needs to be used by by jeremy corbyn but it's absolutely right and that's what the workers party stands for we stand for you know building an economy that works for the many not the few uh, that stands for you know an international policy that promotes peace and disarmament rather than war and arms sales which is what we're doing at the moment i've just come from west yorkshire from uh, keefley and Beldon. And, and towns in former textile industry yeah. devastated. Yes, yes. Every every Uber driver I had was his uncle, his father, yes, yes. his brother, and even many of them who were over a certain age worked in these mills. Yes. So there's there's a lot of people out there who are going to listen to this yes. uh, message and George's uh, election victory tonight. Will it give hope to people like that? Yes, I think I think it will. Absolutely, it will give give hope because it will demonstrate that the political duopoly can not just be challenged, but can actually be defeated. And, and, and a message of hope on the international and the domestic front actually can win a sufficient support to actually, you know, get people uh, uh, elected. And uh, you know, we're probably not going to bring back the, you know, the textile mills, but there are other. You know, um, industrial opportunities, economic opportunities that could be uh, brought in. As I've said, you know, there should be a massive investment, for example, in our public services, which are in a dire state at the moment. We should be investing massively in our infrastructure. Uh, you know, in terms of the green agenda, you know, people are concerned about uh, the increasing uh, the uh, uh, severe weather patterns that we are experiencing. But one of the things that we could be doing, for example, rather than digging, uh, building bigger and bigger walls downstream, it's only so high you can build these flood defences, why don't we uh, have a policy of reforesting the uplands? That would generate, you know, thousands of jobs. It'd be environmentally, you know, uh, beneficial. Uh, but in terms of, you know, it's capturing CO2 and things like that, for those people that are concerned about that, and I know, I know there are some sceptics about it, uh, uh, but of course the other thing it'd do, it would, it would um, eliminate the flood problem downstream because that would mean that you'd be able to hold the water for longer on, on, on the uplands and so on. So things like that, you know, a big house building uh, programme would uh, tackle a huge social need, you know, eradicate homelessness, but also create good quality uh, jobs, you know, and let's invest in our, uh, you know, in our high tech industries as well. I mean, that's where, you know, we can excel. Uh, and these are the sorts of things that, you know, that we should be investing in and giving people uh, hope. Look, John Maynard Keynes, that great economist, in 1930 made a speech where he said that uh, his grandchildren, i.e. my generation, I mean, I'm 67 now, 
um, would only be working 15 hours a week because of the advance of new technology would enable the working weeks have been reduced by that amount. <clears throat> Indeed, when I was actually uh, growing up in the 1960s and 70s, we were being told to get ready for the leisure generation. Local authorities were being told to build leisure centres, golf courses, tennis courts and things like that to give people, you know, things to do. Um, that never happened though. I mean, the new technology has come, but, but the benefits of that have been accreted by a tiny minority, thanks to neoliberal economics, which was actually heralded into this country, not by Margaret Thatcher, but by a Labour government by Dennis Healy and Jim Callaghan when uh, after Harold Wilson stepped down, stepped down. Well, indeed. You know, so, um, you know, people often credit, if that's the word of putting it, I'm way of putting it, but they you know, blame, you know, Margaret Thatcher for, uh, you know, the neoliberal era, the, the monetarist yeah. era. But the truth is, it was actually started by the uh, Labour well, government. I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't get her off the hook. Or a no, 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 no. She they didn't start it. She turbocharged They took the ball around She turbocharged it. That's absolutely true. But look, the Labour Party manifesto in 1974 promised an irreversible shift in the balance of wealth and power for working people and their families. Now, what we are calling for as a Workers' Party is, is a return to that commitment to bring about that irreversible shift. That reminds shift. me when Jacques Delors came here and made a speech to the TUC, I yes. believe, Trade Union Congress, saying that there would be a social Europe, that the European Union, which was only being discussed back then, that was a would be basically trick. social. But that was a confidence trick, I think, and uh, that was a big mistake to uh, you know, get behind the European Union. But the European Union has always been a, a, a capitalist club, a neoliberal club. <coughs> The best thing, probably the only good thing really, if I'm, if I'm honest about it, I might be being a bit unkind to Gordon Brown, but, but, but the best thing he ever did was to keep Britain out of the Eurozone. Having your own currency, issuing your own currency, gives enormous flexibility to a progressive government to bring about a good society, because we never run out of money, you know? Money is literally no object for a government that issues its own uh, currency. The only impediment, the only uh, you know, barrier, if you like, the only thing you need to be mindful of is ensuring that you don't exceed the ability of the economy to absorb that spend because then you you know you create a, an inflationary pressure uh, but if you match it to real you know real resources available in the economy yeah. uh, then you know you can you can basically you know the, the sky's the limit and you know where you are potentially as a position we're nowhere near that at the moment but where you are a potential potentially as a result of public spending uh, you know potentially creating uh, you know a situation of inflationary pressure you know overheating the economy well then you can use the tax system that's what tax is for not to raise money Taxes don't actually fund our public services. Uh, the, the, you know, the government just creates the money. Um, but, but tax can be used where you would be potentially competing with the private sector for those scarce resources. You can actually tax out the ability of the private sector to actually purchase those resources to give space for the, uh, the, the public sector to invest in those public uh, priorities. So, you know, we should be investing in public transport, we should be investing in public services, in, in, as I've said, in improving our infrastructure, building the homes that, that, that people need, creating, you know, the good society, reducing the working week and so on, and, and giving people the ability, you know, to grow as, as human beings, to grow as a, as a community and as a society. But, you know, neoliberalism and the Thatcherite -like era has actually attempted to smash that sense of social solidarity that was so apparent in the post-war consensus and we like, need to, re we need it, to recapture that. It seems that. like it should, have, it should be for a while now a spent force, whether in the Labour Party or in the Conservative Party, this neoliberal economic policy. Well, you it's been a so. failure, except for the wealthy. Well, for the wealthy, but, but that's, the, it, that's But like, they continue to fool uh, enough voters to, con well, to they do. bring them back. Yes, they do. But so I don't want to over... Uh, I don't want to exaggerate the uh, significance of Galloway's victory tonight, but you mentioned before that in the Labour Party there was a peace movement. There's an ex extreme parallel with the United States. The Democratic Party also had a peace. When they didn't have a socialist wing, but they had the New Deal wing, and that's been decimated as well yes. because of neoliberalism. Joe Biden uh, is <laughs> running again, and there was just a poll uh, a few days ago that 77% of Democrats, Democratic voters, want a ceasefire in Gaza. Yeah. And this guy, I mean, the, the golden rule for any politician is you'll do anything to be re-elected or to get elected. And yet he seems to be following Israel down to his own demise. And I don't know how to explain that. I don't know if anyone can explain that. But is this, uh, these two spent forces, the Democrats and the Republicans, the Labour and Conservative, uh, are we looking at something new tonight? Well, my, that's, Potentially my, new anyway. that's my hope and that's my expectation. Uh, Look, it's small beginnings, and let's not, you know, uh, 
get ahead of ourselves, but it certainly I think is, is, is a huge um, beneficial step in the right direction. But, uh, you know, regrettably on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, you know, the political class are running scared of the Israel lobby. You know, the, uh, the Israel lobby is very, very powerful in this country. You know, they weaponized uh, anti-Semitism. They use that to destroy uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, you know, we see a similar thing in the United States of, of America. Uh, but we need the confidence to stand up to these characters, you know, I mean, and uh, I mean, look at the way in which Israel has been conducting itself uh, very, you know, overtly <coughs> over the last five months. But look, this isn't a new phenomenon. I mean, they've, they've been oppressing the Palestinian people for 70, well, 76 years now, uh, you know, since the, the Nakba, and indeed before that, you know, Israel was a country uh, that was built on terrorism, and they've implemented a ruthless apartheid system now for 75, 76 years. They've been in breach of, of international law in relation to the occupied territories now for, what is it, 56 years, and they have imposed this blockade against uh, the Gaza Strip for uh, 17 years. But unfortunately, you know, um, for a large period of that time, uh, people in this country, and indeed across the Western world, were, were in the dark about that because the the mainstream corporate media, uh, you know, drew a veil over that. We didn't know the reality, we didn't know the truth. But now, thanks to platforms like yours, and thanks to, you know, citizen journalists on the ground, uh, you know, posting things on social media, uh, increasingly people are seeing the reality. And, you know, they're absolutely, understandably, horrified by that. And, you know, the more that, that people learn about the reality of Israel, the more they're utterly disgusted by it and want to see change. And, you know, what we need is, uh, as well as, as I've already mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, isolation of uh, the Israeli uh, regime, uh, we need a process of de-Zionization, just after the, as happened after the Second World War, where there was a process of, of denazification to rid Germany of the, of the toxicity of that Nazi ideology. We need to have a similar process of de uh, in Israel and indeed across the Western world. I know we need to be closing down Zionist organizations. We need to be demanding that the Jewish groups that are associated with these Zionist outfits actually, you know, recant and, uh, and uh, you know, um, you know, come away from that uh, because, you know, people uh, will not, uh, you know, look kindly on, on any groups, which, you know, which continue to make excuses for genocide, utterly appalling. I mean, this, this today, was it? We saw starving Palestinians uh, clamoring for food mowed down. Yeah, what in God? I mean, how that can anybody in God's name actually, you know, uh, make excuses for that? And every day that this happened, and every day there's something like that, yes. is chipping away yes. amongst the population, not yes. the political no, leaders who are somehow still yes. Yes. bought by this Israel lobby. Yes. Yes. But every day, more and more people, our eyes are opening. And yes. it's just a consequence, in my view, of having impunity for these many decades. Yes. That you, after all, you've lost your mind and lost touch no, with sure. reality and you continue to commit atrocity like that because they're getting away with it exactly. still and they're portraying themselves as the victims, and which is have, extraordinary. And they have this maximalist strategy where, you know, they won't take yes for an answer, you know, they, they get a bit and then they want more, they yes. want more, they want yes. more. Yes. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, they, they've shot themselves, as it were, in the foot, if I can, you know, use an unfortunate uh, 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 yeah. phrase. Uh, but, uh, you know... Um, I don't think that, you know, Israel, I believe Israel's days are, are numbered now. Uh, I mean, I just think that uh, world opinion is, is so strong in spite of the, you know, huge influence that they have. Uh, I think that um, there's going to be a reckoning uh, for, uh, for Israel and, uh, you know, this, this, this um, overt genocide that they've engaged in is going to lead to, uh, you know, a sea change. Let me ask you one more question. Uh, you mentioned Jeremy Corbyn before. What's his relationship with the Workers' Party? <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, Jeremy's not a member of the Workers' right. Party. I mean, he's, he, I mean, obviously, I worked very closely with with Jeremy when I was a, uh, a Labour MP. Um, he knows George Galloway uh, of old and uh, has worked very closely with George. And indeed, uh, when George was being expelled from the Labour Party, and he, when he went to his kangaroo court hearing uh, before the Labour Party National Executive Committee, accompanied actually by Tony Benn and Michael Foot. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, as I understand it, was outside demonstrating his support for uh, uh, George Galloway. I believe that Jeremy was one of the founder members of Labour against uh, the witch hunt all those years ago. Um, this day and age, anybody who had the temerity to support somebody who was suspended or, or expelled uh, would be themselves thrown out of the party. I mean, I mean, it must be dozens of people who have expressed support for me or, or, or simply said, you know, nice words about me. It's just me. 
Uh, they've been expelled from the Labour Party for that. It's quite astonishing. We've never seen such an authoritarian streak in, in sort of the Labour Party. And that's why, I mean, look, the Labour Party is riding high in the opinion polls. And chances are, notwithstanding, you know, our efforts to fight this insurgent campaign across the country, the likelihood is that, 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 uh, they, that they will uh, potentially win the uh, election. But um, not because people are necessarily, you know, in love with the Labour Party and support their programme, because I haven't really got a programme which is different to the Tories. It's just that people are so sick of the Tory party and of the Tory party has become so toxic that they see potentially Labour as a lesser of two evils. But as I keep saying, the lesser of two evils is still evil. And, and our mission really is to, you know, alert people to that fact that Labour's going to offer no alternative in reality. They'll tinker at the edges, but there'll be no meaningful change. And, uh, and you know, we will obviously work overtime now to try and uh, encourage people to have the confidence, and that's why this victory tonight will be very helpful and beneficial in, in that regard, to uh, you know, have the confidence that uh, you know, insurgent campaigns, alternative insurgent campaigns, offering a genuine alternative, can succeed. And look, you know, we will work with other groupings. We're not saying that everybody has to support the Workers' Party, and we will work to have an electoral pact with other you know, progressive independent uh, campaigns and political parties that share our uh, values. Um, uh, you know, to ensure that we maximise uh, the impact. Well, how many members of Parliament are in that <coughs> progressive At the moment, caucus? Yeah. Well, hardly any, if any, really. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, I, I find that to my uh, shock uh, when I was a member of the uh, Parliamentary uh, Labour Party and found that, you know, what should have been that progressive caucus, the socialist campaign group, were anything but. I mean, the most thing, the thing that they were most concerned about was their career in the end. None of them were prepared to speak out against the witch hunt. And none of them were prepared to speak up for people who had been unfairly traduced. I'm talking about not just ordinary activists, uh, grassroots members, which I was doing speaking up for, but also some of the high profile people, people like Ken Livingston, former mayor of London and leader of the Greater London Council. And look, Ken Livingston has done more than anybody in public office to advance the cause of anti-racism in the 1980s, early 1980s and earned the sobriquet as a loony lefty, partly because of his stance on fighting racism. And now he's been, you know, labelled as a, as, a, as a sort of a bigot and seen as a, as a pariah in the... It's absolutely outrageous. Ken Livingston should be, a, you know, a venerated elder statesman of the Labour movement. Uh, but that, that's the, the kind of uh, level of it. And uh, none of them were prepared, the socialist campaign, were prepared to speak up on that. Nor were they prepared, as I was trying to persuade them, I was the most active member of the campaign group, to persuade them to, you know, push Jeremy Corbyn and uh, John McDonnell, when he was a shadow chancellor, because he was quite conservative, actually, his economic prospectus, to push them from the left, to create space for, for, for the Labour leadership to go further. Because I was saying, look, all the pressure's coming from the right. We need to give them space to go further because the economic agenda uh, that we're putting forward could be considerably more progressive than I mean, we were talking at that time about, for example, uh, Jeremy was saying, you know, we, you know, his, his ambition, one of his ambitions was to eradicate uh, street homelessness by the end of a parliament, which is a laudable aim, of course. But I was saying, look, we should be going further than that. At that point in time, I think we were still the fifth biggest economy, we're now the, the sixth biggest economy. I said what we should be saying is we will eradicate poverty in the lifetime of a parliament. With political will, of course we could do that, very easily do that. We have the most parsimonious social security system in, in Western Europe. We should be massively increasing the, the social security budget. We should be investing in new jobs, as I've already said, reducing the, the working week and uh, you know, giving people genuine hope, reducing the, you know, the pension age as well. But we're going in the opposite direction. We're, we're limiting, we're reducing, you know, social security benefits. We, we, you know, we're limiting the amount of support that people can get when they uh, retire, and we're expecting people to work for for longer. I mean, my children, they, you know, they're they're expected to uh, work at least until the 68. I saw something the other day where they were talking about increasing the pension age to 71. It's an absolute bloody disgrace. That's not where we should be going. We should be saying that people, if they want to, should be able to retire at least at 60. I mean, I support the you know the back to 60 campaign. Uh, I mean, there's the a lot of women in this country who were promised they used to be able to retire at 60 and they were promised that they would still be able to retire when it was Labour that increased the pension age, equalised on the grounds of equality. Rather than, you know, reducing the pension down, they said, well, we're going to raise everybody up so that women couldn't retire until they were 65. Um, and now it's the same, it's gone up still, still further. Um, but, but a lot of the women um, who were born in the 1950s were promised that they would be protected and they would, you know, it was still bad, but, you know, they, they, would, they would not be, you know, they would not suffer the consequences of, uh, of this change in the, in the pension policy. But then when the Tory and Liberal Democrat uh, government came into office, they reneged on that commitment. So there's been a big campaign about that to, to 
get justice for all those uh, uh, those women uh, that were gave that, gave, given that promise. But there was another campaign saying they wanted to, uh, you know, bring bring back the back to six a campaign for all people, for for all women. But I was saying we should be going for that. It shouldn't just be for women; it should be for men as well. If they want to retire, I mean, if people want to carry on working, that's yeah. fine. But there are certain occupations. I mean, I used to work in the building trade. You know, when you get to a certain age, I mean, I'm absolutely tied out and I've just been on my feet and I'm, all I've been doing is talking and standing and talking to people, you know, and I feel tied out. I mean, you know, doing an eight or nine hour uh, shift right. uh, as, a, as a manual uh, uh, worker, as a bricklayer, as I used to be, um, you know, it's quite difficult. I mean, some people can do it, you know, uh, but they should be given the option. I mean, yeah. occupations like teaching, quite a stressful occupation, you know. Yeah. Uh, now, some, some may have the acumen to be able to continue beyond, beyond uh, 60 and so on. Uh, but they shouldn't be forced to do that, you know. And I was involved in a campaign, and one of the reasons that Ed Miliband sacked me from the front bench in 2013 was because I was supporting the firefighters' uh, industrial dispute with the government at the time, who wanted to increase the, the pension age uh, for uh, firefighters. Again, they'd been given a commitment, because the Labour Party had increased it, but they said it would only apply to new starters in the fire and rescue service. Because um, up until then, the firefighters could retire at 55, and if they got enough uh, years in, they could retire at 50. Uh, but they wanted to increase it to, to 60. But that was absurd uh, because you know many firefighters haven't got the physical capability, the lung capacity, and so on. Yeah. And um, you know, you want people that are fit. You know, if your house is burning down, yeah. you know, or, or you're caught in a flood, you want people that are fit that's going to be able to to rescue you. Um, and so they, you know, they fought this campaign. Uh, and uh, so they've been successful actually subsequently in, in, in the law course because it turned out that it ended up being discriminatory because through scientific research it was demonstrated that uh, women tend to lose their lung capacity more quickly than, than men do and so consequently women firefighters would be forced out and, and basically what they were saying was well if you don't meet the, the physical criteria you're out on your ear with no, with no sort of compensation for that I mean, a totally ruthless approach, you know, and uh, because I was supporting uh, them and, and, you know, and, and, and going on the news and, and actually supporting their industrial uh, dispute, uh, I was uh, sacked from the front bench. That was an indication, really, of how far the Labour Party was drifting away from its roots, because the Labour Party was founded by the trade unions, you know, yeah. and we should be supporting, you know, workers in struggle. You know, that was what was refreshing when Jeremy became the leader, because that's what the Labour Party started to do. But unfortunately, we've gone further back. In fact, we're, we're in a, the Labour Party, that is, they is in a far worse position than it was before Jeremy be ever got elected. They should forfeit that name. Thank, Thank you. you. Chris Williams, thank you very much for spending time with Victoria. Nice, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.